Swimoutlet.com delivers the best online shopping experience. With an extensive selection and the lowest prices, you're guaranteed to find the product you need. Here's what you get. Free shipping on all orders over $49. Free one to two day shipping on all orders over $99. All orders placed by 6 p.m. ship out the same day. Shop at Swimoutlet.com, the web's most popular swim shop. This is the Morning Swim Show for Monday, August 13th, 2012. I'm your host, Jeff Cummings. Today in the Finice Monitor, we'll talk to Bruce Weigo. On Friday, he told us about an exhibit featuring the history of Olympic swimming put on by the International Swimming Hall of Fame, of which Bruce is the CEO. And today he's going to talk about the history of swimming in Great Britain. Bruce, good to see you back. How are you doing? Doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me back. All right. So after this, uh, after you put on this exhibit, you got some time to uh, travel to Brighton, um, where I understand there's some great history to talk about in swimming. Tell us about it. Well, Brighton was a, a resort that uh, King George the Third, which uh, some historians may remember, is the guy that lost the Amer American cause to uh, to ind our independence. But in the middle of the 1700s. Brighton, uh, the idea of swimming for health and sea bathing for health became something very popular in England, and Brighton was where the revival of swimming was uh, in Europe. Uh, swimming as a competitive activity originated with the British and the English, and uh, Brighton was a place that it, that it started at all. So it was a great trip to go down and see Brighton, which in the early 1800s, became the first great seaside resort and led to the resorts in the United States in Cape May, Newport, uh, Coney Island to become resorts in America and it followed the lead of, of the people in Brighton that, that were doing this primarily for their health but then into competitive swimming and I had there was while I was there I also got to see an exhibit that just opened up and it was pure coincidence uh, on the history of the Brighton Swimming Club, which is the oldest, or reportedly the oldest, continuously operated swimming club in existence, back to the uh, middle of the 1800s, actually early 1800s. Well, we were just showing photos of you at Brighton, and it definitely is a great beach and very scenic. I, I got to wonder, though, I can't imagine that was a, a good place to swim year round. I mean, England gets pretty cold in the winter, so, you know, was this just a uh, kind of a seasonal thing in the spring and summer? It, it was a seasonal thing. It was basically a summer resort uh, where people could get out of uh, out of London and go enjoy the health benefits of the sea air and the salt water and the beach. And it's uh, it was really a great surprise. I mean, today Brighton is a is a fantastic beachside city that with buildings along the uh, along the waterway dating back to the 1800s, and you can still see a lot of the original buildings of when this was. Uh, a uh, fantastic resort 200 years ago. And the water was, I uh, went in and swam out in the sea, which is something I'd, I'd wanted to do since I first became aware of the history of Brighton. And walk the beaches, and the, these are not sand beaches, they're pebble beaches, but this is where they had these Victorian bathing wagons that would take women down to the water's edge so they could change, get in the water and come back in in a wet bathing suit so no one could see them and uh, expose their modesty. So, but at this little museum, they had images of uh, swimmers uh, swimming there in the 1800s and the races out on the sea alongside these great piers that they had. So Brighton today is kind of a combination of Wildwood, New Jersey, Atlantic City, Venice Beach. It's uh, it's really kind of a wild place, and you'll you'll see that on some of the video that you're you'll be showing here. So, it, I guess it's kind of understandable about why Great Britain would be at the forefront of swimming. I mean, it's an island nation; they're surrounded by water. Why do you think that it didn't translate into competitive swimming? I mean, you would think that if they were kind of at the forefront of, of swimming for health and then later swimming as a competitive sport, that they could translate that to a lot of medals at the Olympics. Well, historically, in the uh, 1896, 1900, 1904, 1908, well, not 1904, they didn't send anyone, but 1908, 1912, 1920, the British were the leading swimming medal winners. Uh, so it did. It's like the Brits were the great in virtually every sport in the beginning, and then when everybody else figured it out, uh, they did. I don't, I don't know how much history really translates 
into modern times there. I mean, America has such an incredible tradition of competitive swimming. But uh, as far as competitive sports go, the Brits seem to be pretty occupied with football. Yeah, I think that's, I think probably in the, after maybe even World War One, I, I think even across all of Europe, it just really took over with football and just, um, you just can't look back from that. Um, a little bit, tell me a little bit more about this museum with the, uh, regarding the oldest continuously operating swim club in the UK. I mean, that's a lot of history with a long time too. Yeah. It's a lot of history and they had posters back to the 1850s of swimming meets there and, and pictures of their teams and and that and actually it was uh, the, the little museum was part of Brighton University and they had gotten a grant from the lottery which is uh, what's kind of incredible and very different about swimming over in Britain is it's funded by the sports lottery so their swimmers are getting funds that come out of the lottery and they, I think they do quite well so it's really not a financial issue that why they're not performing better but uh, this museum was was created through an endowment through the sports lottery, and it was actually in the uh, Brighton Fishing Museum, which is right along the walkway. So if you can imagine a, a museum, is it rather... Other small people are biking and walking, although it was super crowded, and amusement rides and everything along there, and this little museum was tucked back in there. And uh, it really showed that it was just filled with posters and pictures of water polo teams and swimmers, swimmers and swimming meets from this early era. But the, the real, the real, it didn't really cover the, uh, that great era. We went into the library. There's a tremendous library there in Brighton. And, and we went up in there and saw all these uh, old graphic images of the early days in the Brighton Museum, the Brighton Museum, not the Brighton Swimming Club Museum. Uh, had the whole history of Brighton as a as a force in getting people back into the water and swimming, which was an art that had been lost during the Middle Ages in response to all the dissipation and decadence of the baths of the Roman Empire. And at that point, swimming was blamed for the fall of the Roman Empire and the corruption of morals. So uh, swimming kind of lost its way in England until it was revived in, in the whole Western culture uh, until it was revived in Brighton and in the, in the city of Bath, England, where the only warm water natural springs was, uh, well, is and was famous Roman Bath. And that and Brighton were revived kind of coincidentally at the same time in the middle 1700s. And that swimming revived in the West. Well, going back even further than that, I understand you got to see some base relief showing some engravings of swimmers going back to probably, you know, B.C. Well, at the Hall of Fame in Fort Lauderdale, we have a replica of a base relief from Assyria, which is uh, on the border of Iraq and, and Syria, that shows swimmers swimming in 800 B.C. And ours is a replica. So when we were in London, I went to the British Museum where they have the originals and uh, got to see that. And it's really, as an historian, an aquatic historian, this is really just such an incredible part of of history that back in that era they depicted swimmers on these base reliefs and you can see them today and it, and it was really a, a really fantastic experience and I'd hope more people would be interested in going to the British Museum and seeing these and and, and observing uh, where swimming had its origins which is the earliest days of history. Yeah it's definitely piqued my interest Bruce I do have a desire to go out to uh, to London and I'm definitely have to take a trip out to Brighton to Take a dip in the Brighton Beach where it all really started for Great Britain. Yeah, no, it's, it was a real pleasure. I swam out around. There's a bunch of piers out there that are uh, decayed. They had fires over the years when, just like Atlantic City, these places, these resorts went into decline and bad economic times. So there were mysterious fires that burnt the piers down, reaping insurance benefits for the owners. But to go out and swim around the pier there at Brighton, as people have been doing for hundreds of years, was really a... Yeah, kind of an aquatically spiritual experience. Yeah, definitely can't wait to do that. Bruce, thanks so much for another great history lesson. Look forward to sharing some more with you down the road. Okay, Jeff. Talk to you soon. All right. So that's our good friend, as always, Bruce Weigel, giving us some great history lessons that we can't always find in the history books. That's going to do it for today's Morning Swim Show. I'm Jeff Cummings. Thanks for watching.